So in the essence of time, everyone, I'm going to begin. Um, we are really pleased that you're here, and we'd like to welcome you to the Clark County Family Training Series. This series in, is in partnership with Clark County, PAVE, uh, PEACE, and Evergreen, Vancouver, and Camas School Districts. Um, my name is Emily Harris, and I am a program manager with WISE. I'm going to give a visual description of myself if people are calling in or if you can't see the screen today. I am a white woman and my hair is brown and uh, long and, and wavy past my shoulders. I'm wearing a striped shirt and I'm in my mid-30s and I'm sitting um, in part of my home office, which is my living room, a lit room on a gray chair. I also use she, her pronouns. Before we begin our program this evening, we wanted to orient you to the Zoom platform. Typically, we are in person for this training series, but um, with the current circumstances, we are online. So we'd like people to please remain muted for the duration of this training series to ensure that everyone can hear the presenter for the entirety of the training. The session will be recorded for future use, and it's a two-hour webinar, so we'll be taking a brief five-minute break approximately around 7 p.m. Um, so to make use of the chat feature, which is a handy feature, um, you can type any questions in there for our, present, for our presenter, Darla Help today, and you can also use the chat for general conversation and comments. Um, Beth, my colleague, and I are here to support you and we'll be monitoring the chat. All of these features are at the bottom of your screen, so in the menu bar, and if you don't see them at the bottom, look at the top. It might be different on your own screen. Um, we also want to say a quick thank you to our presenter, who is uh, Darla Health. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Darla. You're all in for a treat and to the ASL and Spanish interpreters who are joining us this evening. Um, if you're trying to access Spanish interpreting, uh, click interpretation on the menu bar. It's the globe looking uh, visual and uh, click Spanish as your preferred language. And to hear uh, Spanish only, you're going to mute original audio. To access the ASL interpreting, right click on the ASL interpreter's video and they have um, ASL interpreter before their name and then select pin video. Because this event is being interpreted, we encourage and ask that our wonderful presenter, um, Darla, practice pacing um, just so this will allow adequate pauses um, for accurate interpretation. And just a note for all people attending and presenting, um, we're going to be switching interpreters at around 20 minutes. And so thank you in advance for your patience. Will we allow just a brief pause for the switch? Um, all attendees should have received an email with a PDF of the presentation and handouts prior to the event. If you did not receive the presentation materials, please reach out to us directly um, and we'll also post them in the chat. Um, if you encounter any technical difficulties and need support, please contact our team by sending a message in the chat box to myself or Beth McKinney. You can also reach Beth at 971-300-9360. If you're an educator looking for clock hours, we will post the link in the chat um, to collect that you are here and uh, you can also reach out to us directly. So thank you for going through that. We greatly appreciate that you are all here and I'm gonna mute and pass it over to you, Darla. Thank you so much, Emily. And hi, everyone. Um, it's, it's nice to be with you all this evening, even though we cannot be in person. Um, and I'm going to um, also describe myself for those who um, maybe on the phone or not by a um, screen. My name is Darla Helt. I am a grandmother type person who um, is in my late 50s. I have shoulder length blonde hair and I wear glasses. 
I'm heavy set and I'm sitting in my home office, which is also in my living room. And um, I have a white bookcase behind me. I'm, I'm a mom more than anything. Um, first and foremost, I'm a mother and I've been here and been working and had the pleasure to work in the field for almost 30 years now. Um, and so one of the things as a parent that's always most concerned me, there's two things that's concerned me. One is how do I help my kids live a full and meaningful life? And tonight we're going to talk about options and ideas and what that looks like. The second issue that always concerns me is how do I keep that full and meaningful life going when I'm no longer here to do that? Um, We'll touch on that a tiny bit this evening, but if that's something you're really interested in and want to discuss further, um, you can reach out to us at Peace Northwest and we can um, get you connected with another training in regards to that. So I wanted to um, familiarize you a little bit with some of the handouts tonight. Um, first of all, you all have a um, just kind of a, a outline because tonight's um, training is really kind of a facilitated brainstorming. So as we go through these lists and as we look at different things, I really want you to be thinking about your individual. If you are a teacher, I want you to pick out one of your students and really just kind of process what might some options be for your individual in these different areas. And then one of the other um, handouts that you have tonight is this matrix. And I have blank matrices as well as this one with samples. And the reality is, as we become adults, all individuals, as we leave home at 18, or if we stay home at 18, we all need to answer some of those same questions. We all need something to do, a place to live, how are we going to pay for things? How are we going to get around? Who are we going to socialize with? And how are we going to get our physical movement? If we stop and we look right now at COVID and how COVID and all of this stuff has kind of impacted our life, these are still the questions that all of us are trying to answer for ourselves. What are we going to do? Are we able to work from home in our living rooms? Um, are we essential workers and still working in our place, workplace of origin? Or unfortunately, have we been one of the ones who's been laid off? Um, where are we going to live? Um, I know sometimes with all the shutdowns, we have more um, families cohabitating and more different generations cohabitating. So that's something to think about. And then that funding piece, really, what is that going to look like? Transportation right? And so we're going to go through each of these things. How do we socialize? I know for me, um, I socialize a lot on Zoom, just like this. Um, and it's a, it works to play games, to um, connect with your friends, to connect through work, to do all kinds of things. And I know that for me right now, that physical movement piece really needs a lot of attention because I don't have a good answer for that. So as we go through this journey to a whole life, um, it, I just want to make sure that it's understood that this truly is that. It is a journey. Um, it's not a destination. Um, many of us might have thought we had arrived one place or another a year ago, and yet here we are today in a completely different situation. So with our adult sons and daughters who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities, unlike a lot of individuals, they need help figuring out a lot of these answers. It, and the reality is some individuals who don't experience intellectual and developmental disabilities need help figuring out some of these answers. Some people just seem to fall into them. Other people need to be more intentional. So let's look at what this looks like, right? This is just the reminder, life is a journey and not a destination. I mean, think of it yourself. Have any of you feel like you've arrived where you want to be in life? 
Okay, so let's go down the path to the journey. One of the first things, or for me, the most important thing in my journey or my life is friends and family. And so when my sons, I didn't say this, <laughs> I'm the mother of three sons, two of which experience intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, they're all adults now, and I actually have adult grandchildren at this point in time as well. Um, but when my sons who experienced IDD left school and was really looking at what's life going to look like, one of the things that was a big concern, and during COVID continues to be one of the biggest concerns, is how do we connect with friends and how do we keep our relationships intact, right? So with or without COVID, how do we make those connections? What do we do with friends? When do we connect with them? And how do we make new friends? Friends are pretty easy during that K-12 or K-21 school experience. We're able to meet friends in our classroom and do lots of different things. Um, but outside of school, if we haven't learned some of those um, basic social skill connections while we were in school, after school can be quite shocking. So if your son or daughter is still in school, I would ask you, do they know how to contact their friends? Do they have lists of phone numbers or emails? Do they know how to Zoom? Or do they have the phone numbers programmed? Can they call and make that connection? If they're not nonverbal, can they, if you set up a verbal platform such as Zoom or something else, is there a way that they can connect with those individuals? You know, there's some programs that are in place during non-COVID times, such as Special Olympics or Parks and Rec or Boys and Girls Club, right? And so looking at how are our sons and daughters going to continue to connect outside of school? I'll tell you, I think the biggest disability in the entire world is loneliness. And it, loneliness can override any and everything else. And making sure that our sons and daughters as adults are not lonely is huge. And I'll tell you, no matter how much work you do, there's times when, like right now with COVID, everyone experiences some of that. Um, I found myself in the last two months realizing that both of my adult sons' social circles had shrunk quite a bit during COVID and that I had become the center of those social circles, that I no longer was just mom and the parent provider and but I now was their best friend as well and their entertainment. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired and I want to be their mom. I want to be their support person, but I don't want to be their whole world. I want them to have a world outside of me. One of the things I talk about is on the day that I no longer am here, I really want my children to lose their mom, because losing a parent is a really hard thing. I don't want them to lose their care provider, their best friend, their housemate, and their parent and their home all in one day. I want them to be able to grieve me as a mom and still have their life intact. So on that note, when they're out of school, um, when and how often are they going to connect with extended family and other family members, right? How are they going to, what is that transportation going to look like? What are holidays going to look like? What does extended family look like? And sometimes not even just extended family. So I'm sorry to talk so much about my boys, but that's the experience lens in which we're taking this journey tonight. Um, but how do we, um, you know, my younger sons, how do they connect with their older brother, right? Does the older brother always have to be the one to reach out? Or have the younger sons who are in their late 20s and 30s, have they learned to reach out to the older brother? These are things that now as you're taking this class, 
if you identify an issue or something that your loved one doesn't know how to do, now is the time to be working on that. And if you've got someone who doesn't know how to do that, what kinds of technology and tools can we put in place, right? So um, again, let's say we have someone who is nonverbal. Um, can they, through a cell phone, right, use a program such as Marco Polo or something to reach out and do some at least physical videos to people. Emily, did you have something you needed to? I was just going, yes, I hate to interrupt the flow. I was just going to say we're right at a switch for the interpreter. To... Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How long will that take, Emily? Just a sec? I think about 25 seconds. Okay. While we're doing that, we're going to go on to the next one. So this one, this next slide is huge. Home. Where are our loved ones going to live? Our young adults. And when I say young, I'm kind of talking anybody 55 or younger, right? A lot of times families will say, well, they're going to live with me. Well, that's great, but who are they going to live with when we're no longer here, right? And what does that look like? Um, so when we talk about homes, these are the things we need to consider. Where are they going to live? And, you know, right now, affordability and availability of homes is an issue. Who are they going to live with, right? What is their home environment going to be like, right? Um, what is my decor? I, I always put that one in there because my, um, my son, Jesse, who's 31, is a huge, was a huge KISS fan. And he just had hideous um, <laughs> pictures of KISS and 3D cutouts and all these things that used to scare me to death in his room. Um, because I, every time I went in, I would think there was a man standing there and it was just this giant cutout. So, and then who can assist them, right? You think about yourself. So I'm a um, woman in my late 50s. I've lived in many different places, right? I've lived with lots of different people and I've had lots of different home environments. My sons right now in their late 20s and early 30s, um, my son, who's in his early 30s, is currently living in a condo with a provider right now. And that's working well. But this condo that they are currently living in has stairs. So this is not going to be a place where he's going to age in place. So one of the things I need to be thinking about is what is that next step when and if mobility becomes an issue, right? He's currently living with a provider, but he's lived with other people in his life as well. He lived with his brother and his sister-in-law for quite a while. He lived with another good friend for quite a while. And then he lived with his stepdad for a while. Who was his housemate has changed. The home in which he's lived in has changed. Even his decor has changed. One of the challenges with um, the condo that, where he currently lives is the walls are, the installation in the walls are not good, right? So we had to figure out how um, to insulate that better so that it didn't disrupt the neighbors when he was rocking out. Jesse loves to be a rock star. He doesn't actually play the guitar, but he strums and sings very loud. So we went and we got some of the um, insulation materials that they use for recording studios and such, and we lined the walls with that, right? So being creative so that while yes, the insulation material is productive in that it helps insulate the sound, it still is really within his decor theme of wanting to be that rock star and wanting to always have his own um, recording studio. If you've got questions, guys, or you want to ask specifics, please put it in the chat box. And um, 
Emily can help keep an eye on the chat box for us as well. We have a group that meets. Um, right now they're meeting quarterly and it's called the Home Group, Housing Options Must Exist. And that group is exploring lots of things. And one of the things that we've realized is that there's no single answer to where people live. Some individuals wanna live in an apartment, some need a home, some want a housemate, others need to live independently. Um, and so there's lots of different answers to that. And then there's uh, the other issue around home is there's the piece that we call brick and mortar, which is the physical home in which our sons or daughters live, right? As a mom, I can buy and rent the, the brick and mortar for my kiddos, but I can't pay to provide the assistance paid assistance that they need comes from Developmental Disabilities Administration if you're a DDA client. If you're not a DDA client, you might be able to get that service through aging and disability services. That service is called, I always call it personal care. It also sometimes is referred to as community choice. And that's someone that can come into your home and help provide those services that you need, those activities of daily living. So cooking, cleaning, help with shopping, um, meal preparation, if you need help with um, grooming or hygiene, laundry, all of those types of things. Those are the types of services that may be available through DDA or through aging and disability and can help our sons and daughters be more independent as they, for them to live in a place, a brick and mortar place that may not be with us. Okay, employment or contribution. This kind of falls into that um, something to do. Um, you know, we all need something to do. And so are you going to get a job? Are you gonna volunteer? Are you gonna go to school? Are you gonna, be really involved in Special Olympics and, and um, just really be involved with others. There's lots of opportunities, typically in non-COVID times, as far as activities that our sons and daughters can do. But as we're all experiencing right now, um, with COVID, what we can do is pretty limited. And one of the things that I actually kind of appreciate about COVID I know that sounds like a strange way to say that, but um, is that it gives us a glimpse as to what into what people, our sons and daughters' lives will look like if we don't put things in place for them. My sons don't know how to go create their own life. If I don't help set that up, it's not going to just magically happen, right? So... This guy right here, this big guy, that's my son, Jesse. And this is the owner of the company he works for, Ryanette. And this is some of the people that he works with. Now, Jesse has not worked since March. And I'm here to tell you that while the money's missed a little bit, what's missed way more than the money is the socialization and the, um, I've even noticed his self-esteem not being as strong because, you know, when he worked, he felt really proud that he had something he could do. Jesse doesn't read or write. Um, and so what Jesse did for Ryanette was he cleaned the warehouse. They taught him how to sweep the floors. And Miss Emily was his job, job coach who created his first job. And she helped him learn how to take out the trash or the recycling or different things like that by setting up a matching system. So Jesse was really into, um, at the time, he was really into uh, Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds. He really liked this little whorehouse in Texas. Oh, Emily's on again. Do we need to pause? Nope. Okay. And... Um, and so Emily set up like the trash can would have Dolly Parton on it. And then 
where he needed to empty it would have Burt Reynolds on it. Is that correct, Emily? Is that how you did it? So your uh, son has one of the most eclectic and wonderful tastes of anyone I met. And it was Burt Reynolds, Dolly Parton, yogurt from Spaceball, Charlie Sheen, um, someone else, really great list. And it was a matching system. So each system was categorized. Oh, Aerosmith. Aerosmith was on there. So he would match his list was all visual. And then all of the different supplies had the different characters. Yeah, and so it worked beautifully. And he learned by matching where things go and how to do his job. So Jesse's worked for Ryan at like eight or nine years now, um, with the exception of the last little bit with COVID. And I will tell you, that job, not because of the money, not because of the work he does, but because it gives him value and it gives him importance and it makes him feel like he's part of the team, that job is the most important thing in his life next to his girlfriend. Um, and it's been really hard during COVID. I've seriously, his job is waiting for him. And as a mom, I've contemplated, do I let him go back knowing that he's at, he's medically fragile. So he's at high, high risk for this COVID, it would not, he, things would not turn out well if he contracted this virus. Do I let him go back? Because being at home and not participating is such a um, crash to his system and to his self-esteem. Um, so again, his coworkers, the routine predictability, he did, figure out at first he was shocked that they actually paid him for this. And then he couldn't believe <laughs> after he got his first paycheck, when he got his second paycheck, he's like, they paid me again. He had no idea that you got paid continually for work, but he got to go to this great place and hang out with these great people. And they gave him money for it. He just thought it was the best thing ever. Um, but he was also really proud to say, what do you do? As we just went through this last election cycle, Jesse's uh, nickname at work was the mayor. And he was really concerned that they not fire the mayors because he was a mayor and he knew how that felt. He knew how important it was to be a mayor. But the other thing is to teach him that it's not all about him, right? Um, when Jesse was born, he was really medically fragile. And honestly, he was kind of carried around on a velvet pillow and pretty babied um, for quite a while. And we had to teach him that he is part of the world and that his gift to this world is to give back just like the rest of us. So employment or contribution, for us it's employment, but for others it can be contributing in whatever way that might be. Um, and then your fun and relaxation, right? Um, this guy in the middle, that's my middle son, Rory. Um, and one of his biggest struggles during uh, COVID has been that for fun and relaxation, he likes to go to the um, card shops, the Bat Cave or the CCG house or something like that, to connect with his friends. He plays Magic the Gathering, um, but it's not about the card game. It's about the socialization. And from that socialization, a lot of great opportunities have opened up for him. Right. So I think all of us can understand how limited that fun and relaxation can be right now as we try to, you know, I know at Peace we're doing um, online dances for young adults. We're doing uh, scavenger hunts. We're doing all kinds of things to try and um, connect people to um, each other during this um, time. It's that we recently did a survey at Peace, and the piece that came out the most, the part that came out the most, was really about 
how do we connect with each other and how do we support each other, right? Um, so this is one of Jesse's old friends. They like to get together and strum their guitars. And this is Jess at a work event um, that they had. So that fun and relaxation. Hobbies, right? My son's hobby of cards became the place he socialized the most. Jesse, through his physical fitness needs at Parks and Rec, started um, socializing, right? And then through music, he has other another friend that he likes to go um, watch movies with. You can do movie sharing online. You can watch Netflix together. You can do things on Zoom together, right? Those clubs and organizations I have a girlfriend whose son loves antique tractors. That's his obsession is antique tractors. And um, lo and behold, there in Clark County is an antique tractor club. And so she started taking him out to the antique tractor club. And at first, um, you know, he, they kind of sat in the back and she was really working to try to get him to socialize and stuff. And it took a while, it was a transition. But after a while, the individuals that attended that club got to know her son and they, um, they all had the same fascination with these antique tractors. So they, um, they started picking him up and taking him to the, to the um, club meetings and they started hanging out with him and they started, you know, connecting around those things that are the most important to them, which in that situation was antique tractors but you can connect over anything. Transportation. So, um, whoops, I think it's time for us to switch. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a switch. Okay. It looks like... Bueno. Okay, we're ready to go again. Bueno, parece que estamos listos para empezar otra vez. So... Here we are with Aquí, my tengo. son when he was um, hijo, younger. Cuando... And so, sorry, it looks like we have the wires uh, switch. So we're going to do another switch again. Van a hacer un Fanny, cambio I de conexión you. porque parece que no cambian los canales de audio. And Darla, I hear you too. So another quick switch and thanks for everyone's patience. Okay, thank you everyone. Gracias por la paciencia de todos en lo que intentamos... There we go. Okay, so when my son was young, Gur, I mean, he's in his 30s now, but during high school in his early 20s, he wanted a Trans Am because he wanted to be like Burt Reynolds because he wanted his own Dolly Parton, right? Does it get any better? So he planned and planned and planned to get him a Trans Am. Well, of course, you know, Jess doesn't read or write. So really, we thought about buying him a Trans Am just to have and trying to redo it, but really that's a luxury we just can't do. So let's look at what types of transportation is an option. We have our paratransit here, which is our C van here in Clark County. We have the big buses, which is C Tran. Um, we have riding with dad or learning to drive yourself or Dear Lord, writing with friends here, that's a little scary. That reminds me of my oldest son. Or having your family take you places, right? So my son, Jesse, um, he uses the paratransit to get around. And he uses that to get to work. And pretty much that's the only place he uses it for. My son, Rory, uses the big bus system to go anywhere he wants. Currently, with COVID, they're both kind of relying on family and my son, Rory, a little bit with his friends. Um, so again, right now, things are a little different than normal. But, um, you know, my son was back on the bus and doing things again more independently until things started shutting down a little tighter this week. So what is transportation going to look like for your son or daughter? I'll tell you, I'm a country girl at heart. Um, I grew up up the gorge. And I would love to live out in the country. And when my kids grew up and left home, I got them set up in their own world. 
the first thing I did was move out to the country. I moved up north of Battleground and it was beautiful and I loved it. But I got really, really lonely up there because what I hadn't thought about was where I lived was not on public transportation. So the only way my kids could come see me was if they Ubered or I went and picked them up. And so neither of those really provided a well-established transportation system for them. We now, um, I, we sold that house and I now live in town very close to the mall, which is a fixed bus route. And my son Rory can come here to my home anytime he wants independently. My other son, Jess, lives within walking distance so he can walk over. Um, he was actually here earlier tonight to get something sweet after dinner. And because um, he's just, you know, half a block away. So really thinking about that transportation, not just now and not just how are they going to get to work or get to their friends, but long term and how are they going to connect with you and how are they going to get to your house if, if um, they're not living with you. And then spirituality. Um, this really is about whether you are a believer or a non-believer. It's what is it that you believe and how do we work to help support others, right? So let's lead by serving, right? Um, during the 2010 economic downturn, um, both my guys were unemployed and I made them go out and volunteer. And while there wasn't a lot of organized places for them to volunteer, you know, it's like, you know what? The community parks need the weeds pulled. You can go work on that as you walk through the park. You can do what you can do. Because really helping them realize it's not all about them is one of the best things I can do to help build them up. Um, I didn't realize that until they became uncles. And when my grandsons were born, um, then my sons had to become responsible for someone else. And that really made a difference. And I will tell you, I don't care if it's a sibling, a grandparent, a niece or a nephew, volunteering in the community, finding a way to make them the important one that's giving to others is one of the best things you can do for your children. Okay. Now let's talk about support systems. These are our paid supports, okay? So when we talk about Developmental Disabilities Administration, when we talk about aging and disability services, we talk about Social Security, all of these are our, our governmental funded services and support systems. And while they're lovely to have um, at lots of times in our life, as an adult, they're very critical to have these in place. So let's talk about these. Through the Social Security Administration, excuse me, because I'm going to go out of order. Hmm, excuse me. Um, through the Social Security Administration, you can get supplemental security income. So at age 18, our kids that qualify for this, and this is a functional qualification, can apply and receive SSI. This is currently up to, oh, you know, I'm not good with exact numbers, but I want to say like $783 a month. This money here, this is to provide room and board and shelter and some food, just minimalistic. So you think about that. Where could you live and rent, what place could you rent on $783, right? That's where those roommates really come in handy or housemates. Even if you receive, you live in a residential program or an adult family home, or um, some people refer, refer to it as a group home. Um, if you live in one of those places, you still have to use your SSI, your supplemental security income, to help pay for the place you're living. That is the purpose of that, to pay, pay for utilities and shelter and um, different things. 
if as a parent, if my child's living at home with me at age 18, let's pretend like he's 19 at the moment. And I'm like, well, he's living with me. I'm not going to charge him any rent because he's my child. Um, he's always lived here. He can continue to always live here. That's great. But Social Security Administration is not going to give him the $783 a month if he doesn't need it for rent. Um, so if as a parent, I say, no, he's 18, he's the head of his own household now, even though he lives in my home, right? He needs to pay rent and his portion of the living expenses is we'll say $500 a month and I charge him $500 a month that I then can take, that's now my money, I can take that money and I can put it in a trust fund for him, right? And Social Security is going to pay that full amount that he needs if he qualifies for it. So again, it's some of these are how do we look at not only taking care of our sons and daughters now, but how do we look at taking care of them long term? Um, the SSDI. Um, once we start working as adults, every time we work, we once we earn so many quarters of employment and you all get your social security statement, I think you usually get it about once a year. It says what your social security will be. Once you've earned so many quarters of employment, you can qualify for SSDI, right? So if you, if at age 60, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and I no longer could fulfill my employment needs, I could go on SSDI, correct? Well, my sons being in their late 20s and their early 30s have now worked long enough that they're actually able to pull on their own SSDI. So my son, my youngest son, who's much higher functioning, has worked quite a bit more in his life. He no longer receives SSI. He only receives SSDI. He's only receiving Social Security disability insurance based on the uh, Social Security that he has paid into the system. My son, Jesse, can receive a mixture of both because he's not worked nearly as much. So his social security disability insurance that he paid into the system is not enough to completely make the SSI go away. Um, and then there's SSDAC, which is social security disabled adult child. So let's say I'm, um, I retire at age, oh, let's say 64. I doubt that happens, but I really want to retire at age 64. When I retire, because my son Jesse is still receiving SSI, he then can start receiving Social Security Disabled Adult Child. He can get a portion of my Social Security, which is going to be a much higher amount for him to live on than just the SSI would be. But does that make sense? questions that you guys want to put in the chat. Um, Emily, please track the chat and see if there's any questions there. Um, so you're going to move through these social security systems. This is one of those funding things. So my son, Jesse, receives a paycheck. He only works 10 hours a week, so he's not working a whole lot. He receives SSI, but a, just a little bit, and he receives SSDI. Right. So um, he's able to get all three of those and be able to get a higher amount of money to live on. I think between the three, he's getting between nine hundred or a thousand dollars a month to live on, which is substantially better than if he was only living on the SSI amount of seven eighty three. With the Social Security programs or the SSA programs comes different medical programs. So with SSI or supplemental security income, you're gonna get Medicaid. If you receive $1 of SSI, your son or daughter is gonna get Medicaid. And that's really important because Medicaid 
is what pays for all of your DDA services. Remember when we talked about personal care or community first choice, uh, that person to come into the home and help you, right? Those are all paid with that Medicaid waiver. And the job coach, right? The employment services, those are paid with the Medicaid waiver. So all the supports and services for our sons and daughters to be able to live as independently as possible, to be able to maximize their life experiences, those are paid with the um, Medicaid waiver system. Once you start getting SSDI or SSDAC, right? So that's, remember that's the social security disability insurance. That's the money they pay into the system or the social security disabled adult child, the money I as a parent would pay into the system. With those um, social security programs comes Medicare. So both of my sons currently have Medicare and Medicaid, right? So they have two insurance programs and the Medicaid in addition to medical helps cover all of the other services. So Developmental Disabilities Administration, if you're not already connected to them, please do so. Um, apply, and if you're turned down, call me and so we can explore why you were turned down. And because sometimes you'll get a denial and the denial doesn't necessarily mean you don't qualify, it means they didn't have the appropriate paperwork needed to get your child qualified. So we want to make sure that anyone that may qualify gets connected with Developmental Disabilities Administration because they're really going to help with that piece of um, providing those adult services and supports. Developmental Disabilities Administration does not give your son or daughter a place to live. They are not a housing organization. They do not provide housing. They provide assistance for wherever your son or daughter might live. So your son or daughter will need to rent a place, have housemates, roommates, whatever the system might be, and DDA will help pay for the assistance. Even if you're in a residential program, the individuals, our sons and daughters, and whoever they're living with will pay those rental exp expenses out of their social security and DDA pays for the assistance for them to come in. Um, the one down here on the bottom, DVR, that's the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. So let's go back to the scenario that I was diagnosed with Parkinson's at age 60. Um, I could potentially go to DVR and be retrained because DVR is for individuals who are unable to do their job or unable to get a job due to their disability. So they help with that. Um, we... Uh, with our sons and daughters who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation and the Developmental Disabilities Administration work together in collaboration to help pay for the employment vendors. First, DVR is going to come into play. They're going to do the upfront cost of doing job exploration and community assessments. They're going to pay the job vendor to help find our sons and daughters a job and to help get them trained on that job. DVR is what's considered a short-term funder. They're gonna pay until our sons or daughters are considered stabilized. Oftentimes that's 90 days after becoming employed, but that can vary some. Once our sons and daughters hit that 90 days, developmental disabilities, if our sons or daughters qualify for that, are going to kick in and start paying that 
employment vendor. So in the example of my son, Jesse, Emily worked for an employment vendor called Trillium. And when Jesse first left school, DVR paid for Trillium to help find him a job, to do the assessments, to get him a job and get him stabilized on that job. Once he was stabilized on that job, DVR moved out and DDA started paying Trillium. Emily remained his job coach, but who was paying for that job coach changed and DDA then continued. Obviously, Emily no longer is a job coach, but Jesse is still with the, the employment vendor Trillium and DDA still pays Trillium to help him with those job interactions and to help him um, with whatever assistance he might need on the job. In March, Jesse was pretty stabilized with his job as he'd been doing it for a long time. Now we're in November, Jesse's not gonna go back to work till at least January. When he goes back to work in January, he's gonna need a whole lot of job coaching and a whole lot of help to get him back into the routine, to reteach him and to also explore how the job has changed, right? All those um, coworkers that you saw right now, none of them are working there. They're all working remotely. Right. So what is that going to look like when we go on? So those things are really important. The other thing that I want to make sure that people don't forget is low income services. Because our sons and daughters qualify for as low income, a lot of those low income supports are available. So PUD oftentimes will have assistance. There's low income phone lines you can get. There's, um, my son Rory was able to get um, a really good, amazing deal on his internet because he's low income, right? So while those low income services are not specific to people who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities, they're specifically targeted for people that are low income, but our children also fall in that category. So don't forget to check out those services and supports. Ah, uh, there we go. And all Can of those, that? yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I'm wondering, because you're about to go to the next phase, if now's a good time, we're almost at the hour for our five minute break. If we could just take our five minute break and then when we return, um, we'll switch interpreters. So um, everyone, stretch your legs. Think of a question for Darla. There's a few that trickled in, but we'll ask you at the end. Um, so thanks, everyone. We'll be back at about um, just right after seven. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thanks, everyone, for taking a quick break and a quick breather. We're going to get started again. And again, if you have any questions for Darla, please put them in the chat. We're monitoring that. And thank you so much. Emily, was there any questions that you wanted to ask at this time? Oh, great. Yeah, great, Darla. So um, let me go get to that. So um, one of the questions that came through was, how is watching Jesse or how is watching Jesse live a full life changed your perspective? Uh, has he surprised you or proved you wrong in any way? Yes. So many times. Um, <laughs> great question. You know, Jesse was very medically fragile. Um, when he was born, they didn't expect him to live. Um, they said he would never live to see his first birthday. And I needed to choose between the quality or the quantity of his life. Um, the one thing that is consistent with Jesse is that Jesse does everything in his own way and time. So, he has continuously throughout his life surprised me. Um, and not just always with the things he can do that I didn't think he could, but he also surprises me with things that he cannot do that I thought he could. And his level of functioning is not a straight line that just stays in one spot. It varies. 
um, he has a seizure disorder. So based upon his seizures really impacts his abilities and what he can do or what he cannot do. Um, you know, he, his stepmom, when he was a teenager, uh, thought that you couldn't be a kid and not learn to ride a two wheel bike. Yes, he had a three wheel bike. And honestly, we were still working on potty training. So bike riding was like the least of my worries. Um, but she worked for like three or four years with him until he learned to ride a two wheel bike. Jesse still has his two wheel bike. He rides it. Um, but this year um, he wanted a truck, right? So he's all about the cars and the trucks and all of that, right? He wanted a truck. And to him, a truck meant a three wheel bicycle with a big basket on the back so he could haul stuff back and forth. And so we, he saved his money and he bought himself a three-wheel bicycle. And so now, depending upon whether he wants to go really fast, if he wants to go really fast, he puts on his motorcycle helmet and he, um, he has a, a, a bicycle. We put Harley motorcycle bags on the back of his motorcycle and we made it just as cool as you can make uh, bicycles, right? Um, if he wants to go really fast, he rides that one. If he wants to haul stuff, he takes his three-wheel bicycle and he hauls things. Um, but the thing that always amazes me the most is that even when he learns something, so um, Jesse's second uh, housemate taught him to do his laundry, right? And honestly, I never thought Jesse could learn to do his laundry. It wouldn't have even been on my list of things to teach, honestly. Um, and so, but he learned to do his laundry and he's learned to do it really well. But one of the things that hap has happened is that he checks his laundry all the time. And if it's not sudsing enough, he'll take any cleaning supply available and pour it in there, whether that's bleach or shampoo or dishwasher detergent or Comet or anything he can get his hands on that he thinks is going to help clean his clothes, he's going to pour that in the washing machine. So while he's learned to do his laundry, we've learned to lock up all cleaning supplies from him so that he only has access to only a laundry pot at a time. So uh, yeah, it has. Um, and the other thing is, is just to know that our kids and everybody's kids different, right? Um, my children, it's not just an upward climb. They're, while they do learn new skills, there's things that they knew that they forget for whatever reason, whether it's seizures. Um, my son Rory came down with COVID in the summer and um, we're still trying to get over the, re the ramifications of having that um, disease. So yeah, definitely. Emily, was there another question? Yeah, so the other question was around staying connected um, and Jesse. Uh, how is Jesse staying connected to his work during this time while he's off? Whew, that's a hard question um, because that has been really tough. Uh, he had some phone numbers and um, he called one of his workmates 32 times one day many of it after 10 o'clock at night. Um, so those phone numbers needed to disappear off of his phone. Um, you know, he doesn't always have appropriate boundaries. Um, so that's something that we've really been struggling with. And because employment for him, it's all about socialization, right? So, um, but some of his um, coworkers have made videos and sent to him. Um, I know on his birthday, his boss called him. Oh my gosh, nothing else in the world that he got that day meant nearly as much to him as the fact that his boss called him. Um, so yeah, but that's, it's been really hard. And it's, it's him staying connected with anybody during this time has been hard, right? And I thought we had a lot of good stuff in place. And this challenge that we're experiencing right now is really stretching it 
stretching all uh, supports and services. So, um, and those connections. And I think that's true for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, the other question that came in was, what advice do you have for a parent who might have a child who, I guess, has more support needs? So um, can I ask, um, and uh, hopefully you can put this in the chat, in, in what respects? Are you talking about as far as the housing or as far as the socialization? Um, so it looks like uh, work. For work, okay. So I'm here to tell you, we have some amazing job coaches and it can take a while for the job coaches to find the right job. Um, but I think all of our sons and daughters, I don't care how impacted you are, our, our sons and daughters, they all have things they can do. Um, I had one friend whose son um, was in a wheelchair and um, was quadriplegic. And they actually set up with eye gaze um, for him to be able to trigger an alarm. And so he was doing security inside of uh, stores because nobody expected him to be the security people. So people would choplift in front of him and then with his eye gaze, he could trigger something for someone to come over and deal with the person who was um, shoplifting or doing something they shouldn't be doing. Now, obviously that person had a little bit more cognitive ability, right? Some individuals don't have the cognitive ability, but maybe don't have as many physical um, struggles. And so really it's looking at what can your son or daughter do, right? What is it that interests them? And where are their skill sets, right? Do they um, have a friend whose son um, experiences um, Down syndrome and he's actually fairly impacted with his Down syndrome. But oh my goodness, that kid loves to clean, kid. He's, he's in his forties, but he loves to clean. And his house is immaculate all the time. Being orderly and tidy and cleanliness is highly important to him. Really finding out what it is that is important and figuring out how you do that. Even my dear friend, Sandy, um, her son is pretty impacted both verbally and cognitively. And, um, but he was very social. And for a long time, I don't believe it's still going on now, but for a long time, he did a business. It was actually his own business that Sandy created for him. And it was called Kin Can. And it was um, school teachers or, or people in the school district, or they did it with contract companies, um, construction sites. They could call in to different restaurants and place their order, Ken would pick up the order and deliver it. And though Ken didn't drive, his assistant drove for him. All Ken did was pick up the bag and hand it to the other person and smile from ear to ear. And I'm here to tell you, I would much rather have lunch from Ken than lunch from a, a, a Uber driver or whatever, the Uber Eats, whatever they call that now, right? So that was long before Uber Eats or any of those programs started in. So it's about really looking at what works for your son or daughter and what doesn't. Um, so let's go on a little bit. Um, one of the next areas is to make sure that you see the person, not the disability, right? I could talk to you for, you know, months about the things that, um, the parts of Jesse's body that aren't working the way they're supposed to and how his he experiences life differently than the rest of us but i'm here to tell you he is just a 30 year old well 31 almost 32 year old man he's got a girlfriend he wants his truck and his hot bicycle so he can go fast he wants to wear black leather and he wants to look really good he wants to be able to do what he wants and he wants more than anything for his mother to not tell him what to do I'll tell you, if I even breathe, sometimes I'm doing it wrong because I'm mom. And no matter what I say or do, he's trying to say, no, I'm an adult mom. I don't need you to be my mother, right? 
I'll be anxious when he gets to the point of development where he realizes I don't need to parent him. I just want to be his friend, right? My other sons have gotten to that level of development yet, but just hasn't quite figured that out. So um, that's really important. In Washington State, um, so this picture, this is a group of young adults that have um, went up to Olympia with us during legislative session on a normal year. We go to Olympia every Wednesday and we talk to our legislators, um, the Parent Coalition does, about issues that are important to families and individuals who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities. And that's great. And it makes a huge impact. But when the young adults or the adults, sorry, I always call them young. When the adults go up and talk to the legislators about what's important to them in their life, that has a much bigger impact than me going and telling them what's important in their life. So that's what this is a picture of, having our young adults go up and talk about what's important. That self-determination piece, right? Your son or daughter gets to decide what is important in their life, right? Um, Jesse, poor Jesse. I'm always telling Jesse stories. You know, he likes to drink more than I would like him to drink. And so while as his guardian, my job is to make sure he stays safe and healthy and he doesn't drink too much to impact his health. It's not my place as his guardian to say he can never have an alcoholic drink. He's an adult male. And if that's what he chooses and his doctor is okay with that, then that, and he has the finances to cover it, right? I have some parameters in there. Um, that is his choice. I am his guardian and my responsibility is around making sure his finances are kept appropriately, make sure his health and safety is kept appropriate in a good place, right? Making sure that he's not taken advantage of. It's not to, to um, overlay my desires and my wishes for his life over his. He gets to make those choices of what his life looks like. Um, the PCP, the next on the list, that talks about person-centered planning. So person-centered planning is actually a service you can get through the Developmental Disabilities Administration. And while the assessment that your case manager does each year is considered a person-centered planned assessment, that is different than a typical person-centered planning. A typical person-centered planning is going to be you call together all the people that's important in your son or daughter's life, right? Again, I'll use Jess as an example. When we did his, when he left school, we did his at his church because he was really involved at the church. Some of the pastors were there. Some of the parishioners were there. His extended family came. Some friends came. And his school teachers came. My friend facilitated it. And we talked about everybody's hopes and dreams for Jesse and Jesse's hopes and dreams for Jesse. We talked about what Jess was good at and what really didn't work well for Jess, right? Jesse really does not do well being told what to do. He doesn't work well having to work in a hurry. He needs to be able to do something at his own pace. And he, um, he doesn't work well with really strong um, dominant males. I don't know how else to say that. It's just that those things don't work well for Jesse. But what does work really well for Jesse is humor, is music and the things he likes. It's connecting with other people and feeling important. Those things work really well for Jesse. So all of those things came out of that person-centered plan. All those people who knew Jess were able to feed things into that plan. That information was then provided to the job coach. So when she went to find him a job, she looked for where's a place he can connect with peers, where music is important, where he can connect with the things that are important to him, right? 
And that's where that connection around Ryanette and all those pieces that are important came together, right? Um, exploration. This is an area I feel like as a mom, I failed. Um, our sons and daughters. Nuestros hijos e hijas. Is it time to switch? Será tiempo ya de cambiar. Um, our sons and daughters don't know if they like something if they haven't been explored to, ex haven't had um, a chance to be, um, oh, I can't think of the term, experience it, right? Um, so whether that's sports or whether that's travel or whether that's the theater, right? Whatever it might be, until you try something, you don't know whether or not you're going to like it. And for my sons, um, who are both have autist, autism characteristics, um, they don't have the ability to go, oh, what is it going to look like if I go to the ballet and imagine that? They need to go e experience that to be able to see whether or not that's something that they like. As a mom, I didn't do a lot of taking them and doing things. As I look back on their life, I wish I would have done that more. Um, I wish I would have exposed them to more opportunities and to more experiences in life. Now they're in their 20s and 30s. I still can do a whole lot of that, right? Um, But as I look back, that's an area I wish I would have done better on when they were younger. Um, personal coach. Um, so with personal coach, DDA has some programs and some services that are available. Um, community guide, um, well, I don't even know if that's the right term right now, um, but you could talk to your DD case manager. There's programs, uh, to help individuals get out in the community and to connect with other community members, right? To help identify some of those things that um, they wanna do. I think any of us, if our son or daughter said, oh my gosh, I'm really into football, I wanna go to a football game, right? Would take our, our kiddo to a football game. But our kiddos aren't gonna know that if they're not exposed to it. And so, again, just trying to figure that out. And that's where that personal coach can come in as well. Because I'm here to tell you, Jesse's going to enjoy things um, from uh, someone else more than he would from me. So hold on a minute because I'm going to go backwards. I want to show you a picture real quick. So don't get seasick while I move backwards. Sorry, that's just the way this program is. I don't know how to. Oh, maybe I could just do it down here. There. Well, looky there. So this picture right here of Jesse. Jesse, <laughs> Jesse always kind of reminded me of uh, the little deer on Bambi. Kind of wobbly, isn't he? Right? He doesn't have the stabilist gait or anything. So in this picture, he's actually at one of those bounce um, age, uh, organizations. And he's out there on the trampoline playing basketball. There is no way I could have ever, as his mom, got him in that environment. But a coworker said, hey, Jess, come play basketball with me. And he crawled out there on that trampoline and played, right? So again, just knowing who can ex expose our kids to different things is just as important as exposing them to stuff. Okay, let's see if I can find the right slide I was at. Okay, let's go a little farther. Sorry, guys, just bear with me. There we go. Okay, so, um, and then SAIL. Um, so this last one, sorry. SAIL is Self-Advocates in Leadership. So in Clark County, we have a People First organization that meets at the Arc of Southwest Washington. Um, and they meet, I don't know what they're doing during COVID. Sorry, guys, COVID's really putting a damper on my presentation. But um, without COVID, they meet once a month. 
And it's a great group to get together. And then SAIL, Self-Advocates and Leadership, is a group that meets on a state level. I'm here to tell you, our self-advocates, our young adults with disabilities have gotten a ton of laws through our legislature. They changed, I don't know if you've noticed, the handicapped parking signs are now um, accessible parking signs, right? That's because a group of our self-advocates said, that parking spot is not disabled. That parking spot is not handicapped. That parking spot is accessible. And so systematically our state has been changing all of the parking signs when they need to be replaced, they're not putting extra money into it, but as they need to be replaced, they're being replaced with accessible parking signs, right? Um, they got um, the terminology of mental retardation taken out of most of the state laws so that that no longer, it's now intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's no longer mental retardation. Our self-advocates have done a lot of work with our legislators to just say, you know what? That's not okay. Um, and I, I just think that's wonderful. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, with peace, one of the things we're doing is we have a building independence group. And it's for individuals that are over the age of 18. And um, that it's a peer to peer group. And they meet every Thursday. They've been meeting online through Zoom since COVID started, and they do great. And they decide what's important and what they want to learn. So this month, they're actually working on mood and how to, when you feel sad or you feel upset, how to handle those things. They're working on gratitude and they're working on disappointment, right? They've worked on things like dating skills. They've worked on grocery shopping and cooking skills. They've worked on socialization skills, money, finance, uh, safety in the community, transportation. There's, you know, they've been meeting for three years now. And the group, if something's important to someone in the group, they figure out how to do a class on it. And um, it's a free class. It's open to everyone that's over the age of 18 to just jump on. If that's something that you're interested in, you can either go to the Peace website or you can um, call or email me. Um, I'm sure I got email information somewhere. Um, and on that note, I just want to say, sometimes if you don't put in our entire website address, if it doesn't have the HTTPS in front of the Peace in W.org, it looks like it's been hijacked but it's not the website, it's the, I'm very technologically challenged. It's the route in which you get there, I guess. So let's go on. Um, oh, so when you put it all together, right? Hopefully we reach our goal. And back 10 years ago, 11 years ago, the, when it's like, yay, we've reached our goal. This is what it is. So here's my Jesse, right? That's Jesse's senior picture. He wouldn't let us take his picture. Um, so he was rocking out. He looks really serious, doesn't he? You would never know that he doesn't know how to actually play the guitar. He was playing Smoke on the Water by ACBC for a Christian school um, talent show. <laughs> um, and he got a standing ovation. But that was the only picture I was able to get of him his senior year. And so when we first set up all of these options for Jesse and we, we laid it all out and I got him in his first um, residential setting and we got everything set up, I thought, yay, we've reached our goal. Everything's great. Jesse's statement at that life at that time was my life rocks. Everyone should have a life like mine, right? As a mom, what else do you want your kid to say? That's exactly how I want my kids to feel. But our kids with disabilities are no different than any of our other kids. And what happens is life, right? The game of life. You get someplace, you get everything worked out, and then life happens, right? So Jesse started having seizures. He blew out of his residential program. He ended up moving back home with mom. That did not make him very happy. 
And Jesse not being happy does not make mom very happy, right? So we work hard to get him okay again medically, to get him all stabilized. And then it's like, what are we going to do now? And at that time, I was living in a little condo and um, with a little circular parking lot. And so I rented the um, I rented an apartment a condo right across the parking lot. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Jesse surely couldn't live on his own, right? But Lord, we needed more space because my place just was not big enough for all of us. And we did some networking and we talked to people and we talked and we talked and we talked and we met an incredible, gifted, wonderful human being who at the time was one of his providers who moved in and became one of his roommates. And that worked beautifully for, I don't know if it was four months, six months. Um, and then that person needed to move on. And so that person moved to a different state. And then at that time, it was like, what do we do? Jesse can't live alone. So his stepdad moved in with him. So I know that sounds weird. My husband lived with my son instead of with me. But we all lived within 50 feet of each other. And um, it allowed Jesse to have his own place and still have a parent there that could help take care of things. Right. And we did that for a really long time. And then during this COVID situation, um, my niece moved in with Jesse. And now my niece is living with Jesse. And my husband got to move back in with me. In the meantime, I've moved down around the corner and moved Jesse into the original condo I was living in, right? So we're no longer renting a condo. When we went to rent, we experienced discrimination. And the other concern with renting was, um, that they kept upping the rent and Jesse couldn't afford that. You know, what, what do you do? He's living on a very fixed income. So this game of life and this journey of life is just that it's a journey and you keep trying to figure out, okay, what's next. Right? So um, if you have a son or daughter that you have guardianship of, there are programs out there, mortgage programs out there, where you can actually have two primary residents. So I was able to get another zero down loan to buy another place. So Jesse could live in one place and I could live just, you know, like I said, a half a block away. Um, because of these programs that are out there. Because I'm his um, guardian, I was able to take advantage of that and buy another place. So does that mean we have everything fixed and we've arrived? Absolutely not. I don't know what's going to happen with work when we get ready to go back to work. His socialization right now during COVID is really tight. And um, I was, thank God, his phone broke. Um, in March, and they had already started shutting things down. And so I couldn't go in and get a phone at some place like I normally would. And so the only thing I could do was find, I found these iPhone 11s, which I really couldn't afford, but they were buy one, get one free. So I bought one, I, I got the two iPhones and I gave one to each of the boys. And Jesse learned to FaceTime people. Never in a million years would I have thought he'd learn how to do that. He not only learned to FaceTime, but he's learned how to do talk to text and how to get Siri to read his text to him. So Jesse's girlfriend, who does read and write, texts him and he will say, Siri, read it. And Siri will read to him what the text is if he wants to. Sometimes he likes to, he loves to color. And so he'll make a picture and he likes to write something to his girlfriend, but he doesn't know how to do it. He'll ask Siri how to spell something or how to make a letter and Siri will tell him. I never thought he would know how to do those things. I never taught him those things. Those are things he figured out because he had the equipment that would do it, right? And that FaceTime literally has been one of our lifesavers during this COVID. 
We also, as a family, downloaded a program called Marco Polo. Um, and it's like a um, it's like a video email almost. You you do a video and it sends it to whoever is on your Marco Polo group. And then they can look at it and interact with you um, whenever they get around to it. And then they'll respond with a video. And then you can read it when you get around to it or watch it, not read it. So that and then the other apps that I wanted to tell you about, because even though I hate technology and I think I'm very technology challenged, um, there's apps that are incredible. I have on my phone an app, it's called Life360, and um, it's free. I think I do pay $5 a month for it because I wanted the, to upgrade a little bit, but you can get it for free. And I have, it's called the Help Family Group, and both of my sons have it on their phone. It, they had to, if I pay the cell phone bills, I will pay their cell phone if they have the app on there. If they don't put the app on their cell phone, then they have to pay their own cell phone bills. That's the, that's our deal. But this app will tell me I can go on and I can see where they're at. I can zoom in on the app. And if when um, before COVID, like if Jesse was at Innovative at the Building Independence class, I could zoom in on the app and see if he was still in the training room if he was in the elevator or if he was coming down. I couldn't see a picture of him, but I could see where in the building his dot was, where his phone was. For my son, Rory, who has much more independence and can take the big bus, he can do a lot more things um, independently than Jesse. I can track and see where he's at. Um, and I'll tell you, it's funny because what they've learned uh, Jesse's learned to track me. So if I'm out and I'm by a fast food place, I'll get a text that says, Hey mom, if you're get if you're getting fast food, get me something, right? This is a kid who doesn't read or write and doesn't know how to turn on a computer, but he's learned how to use an iPhone to track his mom to see when she's by a fast food restaurant so he can get his hamburger or his Taco Bell. <laughs> So, um, you know, never underestimate what our kids can do. So, uh, Emily, are there more questions? Uh, so, Darla, there was a question around um, the Thursday group that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And just asking if you could talk a little bit more about that, um, where they meet and what time is it? Okay, so when it's not COVID, they met at Innovative Services Building in the training room. With COVID, it's a Zoom meeting, and we don't publish the link unless you register for it. Um, and I can, um, you can email me or I can send it to Emily and she can send it out to you guys so that we'll send you the link. So it's online. Um, we were really hesitant because we didn't know how our young adults were going to do with a Zoom meeting. And I'm here to tell you, they did way better than most of the professionals when they first started. Um, they just took to it like a fish to water. They, and they're very polite because they can see everyone. They do the, um, oh, I can't remember what the view is called, where you can see the whole group of people at, at one time but they, they can see everyone's faces. And so they really watch to interact politely. Um, it, the class takes place between six and 8 p.m. on Thursday evenings on Zoom. It's free, you can just um, register for it and uh, we will get you that information. So. Great, and then we're gonna um, pause for the interpreters to switch before you add anything else. Great. Okay, and um, there was one question that came through and it was, let's see, there's a comment, Zach is awesome. So someone mentioned that they waited a little bit longer and uh, 
they wish they would have got their uh, child into the group or their family member into the group. Um, but someone asks, how are you? And so I don't know if that, but let's build on that. How are you, how are you holding up these days? Or do you have anything to add about, around your self-care? And how- okay, thank you. Um, you know, I'm okay. I am an individual who teeters between, I'm probably on the line between an introvert and an extrovert. And um, I have the um, blessing of being able to be on the computer, on Zoom, or on the phone with people most of the day. So um, while I'm not person to person with people and I miss that, I still feel like I'm able to connect with people. What was really hard for me was when um, I was trying to work full time and I realized that my kids started depending on me for everything, right? When I became their social world and, and for one of my sons, well, both of my sons, I mean, we're still working on that. It's not like we've arrived. Right. I, I had them set up really well and then COVID happened. And so now it's like, oh, I've got to get more people in their life. So um, that's where we moved my niece in to live with my son, Jesse. And my other son, we looked at, can we do some community engagement um, services through DDA? What can we do at this time to just get other people involved in my kid's life? Because I don't have the ability, I can do anything. This is my motto. I think I can do anything in life, but I've realized I can't do everything. And I've realized there's a whole lot of things I don't wanna do. (laughs) And one of the things I don't wanna do is be everything in my kids' world. I love my kids to pieces. I have dedicated my whole life to them and will. My, my dying breath, my last breath, my last thought will be about them. And hopefully I will work hard to have everything set up. So when I'm not here, they're okay. But they need more people in their life than just me. And um, sometimes letting go is the hardest part. So um, I'm good though. So, um, and if you guys need anything, I mean, peace is here and we're working. All the ladies are working from home. We've got trainings going on. Teresa is still doing special celebrations, which um, so we have at least once a month, we have some kind of an online activity. We're doing grab and go bags each month with lots of different activities that you can do with your son or daughter. Um, You know, we've got the building independence So one of the things they did last month was uh, with Teresa's group, they did a grab and go and everybody got free pumpkins and free pumpkin carving kits and different things like that. And then um, building independence, they actually had a pumpkin. I I don't think they called it pumpkin carving because some people painted on their pumpkin, but um, pumpkin decorating contest. Right. And so just different things. And what can we do during this time and how can people connect? Um, While we were on our break, I got a text from one of the ladies um, that PIR announced that they're still doing the uh, raceway lights this year for Christmas, right? So how do we do the raceway lights and what can we do? It was nice when they were doing the drive-in at the mall, right? Just trying to find those activities that we can do and how things can work. Because this is an interesting time in life, right? I think for Thanksgiving, we've got a training tomorrow night that Teresa's doing on um, creative and other um, different things we can do for the holidays this year, knowing that we can't all do the, um, our typical traditions. Um, I know for me, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to do some baking and some cooking, and then I'm going to go deliver things on each of my family members' doorsteps. So that even though I can't be with them in person, they have something from me to have during their holiday meal. Um, Yeah. Anyway, I could blabber forever. Was there any other questions that anyone had? Is there things I can help you with as far as thinking about issues for your sons and daughters? 
because I, you know, we really want all of our sons and daughters to be as independent as possible. And that looks different for each and every one of them. Emily, was there? Uh, no questions right now. Okay. I'm sure everyone is just processing the wonderful and valuable information that you shared. Well, I, I like just... That someone Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Emily. I apologize. No, I was just going to say, I like that someone asked you a follow-up question because, yeah, I think so often people come and think about, uh, I guess, the, the people we support, but a, a big piece of it, too, is finding a way to navigate what works for you and supporting yourself to navigate life as well. So I think that was a great question. It was, uh, and I appreciate that greatly. There's a question, actually, that just rolled in. Do, um, do you know anything about Stephen's Place Day program? I do. Um, and I can tell you all about Stephen's Place Day programs before COVID, and I don't know what's happening now that COVID's happening. But um, before COVID, Stephen's Place had programs that met two or three days a week, and it was um, up to 12 hours a day and it really was fairly affordable. And they had different activities that you could do. So they had, um, you know, like one day they would do horticulture work, other days they would do, um, they just had lots of different activities like that that you could do. And then specialized athletics actually was meeting out of Stevens Place as well. Stevens Place has a beautiful gym and, um, so that was a great opportunity for our sons and daughters to be able to meet. And I know that we, um, Peace, with special celebrations, we held a lot of our community activities there just because it was such a beautiful um, community center and, and free and accessible to all of us. Um, we are working, there's a big group of us working. Um, Cooney Foundation is an incredible foundation in our um, in the Pacific Northwest that helped get Stevens Place going, and um, them as well as quite a few other places in our um, community and in the state are trying to figure out affordable housing for our sons and daughters with disabilities. Right, it, it's a question that we're all kind of scratching our head with and going, how do we do this and how do we make this happen? Emily, did another question roll in or am I imagining things? Nope, you are not. You're on top of it. And uh, there's, uh, so this person says, I have a lot to ask, but would like to have a call. Um, so uh, Darla, if you can put your phone number, I tried to copy and paste Peace website in the chat. Um, or if you're comfortable, I can type your phone number in. If the that one that I have is the one. Okay, yeah. I can't find chat. <laughs> I told you guys okay, I was yeah. technologically challenged. Um, so my phone number is 360-907-3287. And that's my cell. Um, I work from home. You're I would love for you to call me. That's the phone I'm using for all things. Um, and then my email address as well is Darla H. So D-A-R-L-A H as in house at peace, P-E-A-C-E N-W dot org. Darla H at peace N-W dot org. And our website is peacenw.org. Um, but again, make sure that HTTPS is in there or it's going to show up strange. And if anyone knows a good webmaster, I'd love to hear of that information. Okay. Well, we're nearing the end of our time. Um, there's still a little more time for questions. I don't know if there's anything else that you had to add, Darla, from the presentation? I don't, just any other questions? I just, just to remind everybody, life is a journey, not a destination. I mean, we just, we work from where we're at 
and we work forward and it's always moving forward. And sometimes like this year, it doesn't go forward in the direction we think, but we still learn and grow a lot from these experiences. So are there any other questions in there, Emily? No other questions, but okay. I think with your number and your email, you will be getting those 10 p.m. calls, like you mentioned. Um, no, just kidding. But I also wanted to add um, for everyone, first of all, thank you, Darla, for such a wonderful presentation. It is always such a delight to hear from you and hear your stories. Um, thank you to our interpreters for your support tonight. And for anyone who is uh, interested in continuing joining us in this series. Um, we don't have a training next month. We're taking December off. So we hope that you um, enjoy your month and take care and are safe. And then we'll pick back up in January um, with navigating the adult system uh, in uh, towards the end of January. So uh, please contact myself Emily at Go Wise. I'll put that in the chat or Beth um, if you need help getting registered or can't find th these events. So thank you everyone so much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, Emily. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Stay safe.